So now what I'd like to do is, this is the bit, it sets the pattern, I suppose, the canals do, to invite my next speaker, who is John Hudson, Chairman of Advisory Board, <coughs> Canals and Rivers Trust. It's all about cleaning the canals and improving your health. Thank you. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, oh, did, was I that good already? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we know what's coming. <laughs> 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 Lovely to see you. I've only got a couple of slides, ladies and gentlemen. I'd first like to say, Rashid, what, what a wonderful man. If only we had more, could we be, they be replicated? Um, before I come to my slides, I'd just like to mention a couple of things for the young people here, then the others can, can close their ears if they know it or if they're anywhere near my age. That is to say, single use of plastics is a modern problem. It did not exist when I was a young man. Because all the bottles were glass. All straws were a sort of a, a greaseproof uh, um, paper. And everything was washed up. And you see, the real fundamental problem worldwide is the business model of the American fast food chains and the Coca-Colas and the Pepsi-Colas, etc. Now, I'd like to tell you, 90% of the plastics that goes into the ocean is actually from Africa and South America. And none of them are creators of the original ideas. They have bottling plants, packaging plants, and the like, which are put there under license from the big American manufacturers. Why? I mean, they're, they're desperate to change. They'd love to change. But think about the problem of, of a fast food outlet where you've got thousands of people going through a week, you'd need dozens of washing machines. And you'd need storage place for the plates, and you'd need all that stuff. You'd need extra staff. And so it, their business model is to push things through as quickly as possible and not have to wash things up. And it's the same with, with bottles. I mean, after the war, certainly glass was expensive. The silica couldn't be got and so forth. They went onto plastic because at the time it was very cheap. Plastic is very cheap. It's made from oil. It's a hydrocarbon, long-chain long hydrocarbon. And the cheaper oil is, the cheaper plastics are. But you go to some countries like Kenya, if you go to safari in Kenya, you literally, literally cannot walk from one end of the street to the other without crunching thousands of bottles under your feet. And this is an extension of the American business model. So I put it to you that when, when you say... When Rashid says that it won't make much difference, actually, there's a lot of pressure worldwide, particularly from young people, to sort this sort of thing out. And sooner or later, the business models of the big producers will have to change. They will have to accommodate things. And after all, when I was young, one of the things was to collect bottles for sixpence. You took them in a, pla in a crate back to the shop, and you got sixpence for every bottle. Everybody washed things. Nobody wants to wash things anymore in these fast food outlets, but ultimately, we can see what the damage is, absolutely horrendous. So it, it can't go on like that. Just the other thing I wanted to mention is, why do you think plastics can't be recycled? The problem is colour. Because when you're making, say, plastic spoons, you make them in a, die in a machine, you make about 20 at a time. They're joined up with a sprue. And if they're white, well, the white sprue goes back and it's regranulated and it's used again. Um, but you can only do that so often, and with other colours, they degrade very quickly, and so they degrade to the colour black. So all drain pipes and down pipes are made of reconstituted plastic, but the rest of it can't be used because of the colour. So that is an issue for people. So at the end of the day, I think the real answer is not to use so much plastic. We know how to do it. We, it's only very modern, but the business models must change before we can get round back round to that again. That's going to take time, but awareness is there. The young people have got to be at the fore forefront of that. In the States, I think they are at the forefront. Funnily enough, in the States, in, if you go into a supermarket in America, strangely enough, they don't give you plastic bags. They give you, they give you large brown bags. I don't know why that is, but in the UK, when I was young, there were adverts on the TV imploring shop assistants not to blow into the brown bag. It must you, do you remember? Must you, it said. Must you, must you. The little ladies blowing into the bag because it spread germs, you know. The idea was that you spread germs that way. There was no question of a plastic bag. Everything, <coughs> and we can go over back to that tomorrow. So those are the things that you, you stimulated me to say. And I've got a couple of slides on the canals. Have you got the next one, please? <coughs> 
So um, <coughs> the Industrial Revolution in Britain was between about 1770 and about 1850, where this was an effort to reposition the economy away from agrarian and into metals production. No, no, can you go back to the last one, please? The thing about rivers, rivers uh, only go downhill. But what happens in the Midlands where it's very high and there's no rivers going to the Midlands, how did you get coal, ore and all those things to the factories? Well, you built canals because with canals, there's a lock up there. And for those who don't know how it works, a lock is an area with two gates. The boat goes in, you shut the gate and you drain the water out with uh, paddles. When it's at the level, it goes out again. You can do that going that way, or you can go it going that way. Um, over the years, the, um, the system worked very well. <coughs> um, associated with it, though, is how do you get the water into a canal? And you have to build very large reservoirs. For example, Edgebaston Reservoir was built by Thomas Telford in the 1820s. <coughs> Edgebaston Reservoir is man-made to feed the canals. It's not... It's used for leisure purposes now, it's man-made to feed the canals. So ultimately, the canal system in Britain increased dramatically in size as the Industrial Revolution moved forward. And that is one of the reasons why it said Birmingham has literally got more canals than Venice. It's a fact. In the Midlands, we have more, a vast number of canals, more than anywhere else in the world. We invented them, basically. And they're still operating effectively today. But if you go forward to um, the time, 1947, up to 1947, canals were all basically drawn by horses. When you look at the bridges, some of the bridges, where you see there's a, a gap between the middle, that was where the rope that the horse was pulling the canal with went from one side of the canal to the other. But in 1947, there was the worst um, weather lowest temperature since the, what we call <coughs> the Little Ice Age in 1405. All the canals froze up for six months. And for six months, all uh, the companies, all the canal carrying companies went bust. And the, by that time, the companies, factories all around the Midlands, the Black Country, Coventry, Birmingham, had to find alternative methods of getting their goods to the factories and encourage the use of trains and encourage the use of commercial vehicles. So the canals then dropped into decline over a period of time until uh, the leisure industry took off as, as the country <coughs> became more wealthy. If I can have the next slide. There's Thomas, uh, there is um, Mr. Brindley. They named Brindley Place after him. He created the canals in the Midlands. But where are we now? Um, the decline from the mid, mid 20th century was pretty devastating. A lot of them silted up. Because if you think about water traveling, muck comes from the fields, etc., goes into the canal, silts up. You know, it's very expensive to keep on top of that sort of thing. They silted up, people threw things into it. As time went by, they threw plastic bottles in, supermarket trolleys, all sorts of things get thrown into canals. Um, and it was re rescued. Um, by the government effectively and nationalising it in 1961. So in 1961 it was all bust. The government nationalised the canal system and during 2000s funding from government has, has been more propitious than it used to be. So if you go forward from 1947 when it was moribund to today, <coughs> today you've got the developed canal system in the country, 2,000 miles in the Midlands, you've got um, Problems of keeping on top of it, very maintenance uh, expensive. There are, I think, 20,000 long boats in the country, all which are now driven by diesel engines, paying a certain fee. There are walkers. There are youngsters who visit. There are all sorts of fishermen who pay. But essentially, it's still a charity. And essentially, the government, the, the main funding for that comes from the government. And that funding is going to run out in about 2025. So we are in the process of a major reorganisation try to try to become more relevant. And one of the most important, if I can have the next slide, please. One of the most important things is the question of health, as Rashid mentioned. Those are the stati statistics, but I'd like to say that in the Midlands particularly, the biggest problem we have is diabetes. It didn't used to be a problem. <coughs> diabetes, when I was young, was unheard of. 
Diabetes is now a massive problem in the Midlands. And it's essentially due to four things, really. Too much fat in the diet, too much sugar in the diet, too much salt in the diet, and no exercise. And as people become older, they will die. And, and if that's a good thing that can happen to them, because worse things than that can happen to you, as, as we know. So the fact is, these canals are on our doorstep. They are the greatest thing to walk along. I walk along the canal every day, three miles, and I've done that for 20 years. And I must say that you feel great oh. after a walk on the canal. It's there to do. It's not, I mean, we'd obviously love people to help with restoring the canals, but really what we'd really like people to do is walk along the canals. Now, clearly, from that point of view, there's a lot of clean-up ha that has to happen because in the intervening years I mentioned, tremendous amount of graffiti and other problems that we have to solve, which we're trying to get on top of. But nevertheless, I hope we will, and I hope you, through your communities, will encourage your constituents to play their part. If they can't play a part in, in helping to clean up at least try to get them to play a part in walking along those canals on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, just uh, as, a, as an employee of Canal River Trust, uh, really a great organisation, and, and the resident of Warsaw, I'm really privileged. Uh, I, to be here today, uh, working with the professor. Uh, it's a really nice topic, it's so close to my heart. And uh, with this organization, we are really trying to make a difference. Uh, so where jo John left off with the, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, organization being a navigation organization purely in the past, now we are trying to become a health and well-being charity. Th that means we want people to, we've spoken to a lot of people throughout the country, we've done a lot of studies, and. One of the things people have said to us, we really enjoy being by the water. We don't know what causes that impact, but everybody who's been to the waterway, that something has changed. They feel it quietens them down, it slows the pace. So this is something we are trying to work with mental health in terms of what is the stimulant that causes the impact. But in terms of, uh, uh, as, 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 as the changes have taken place, we have, we have loads of workers, dog walkers, people exercising. We have 3,000 plus volunteers who are, who are helping us nationally. So it's taken off, but we want more. We want the, the waterways to play an economic hub for the communities. We want to be part of the neighborhood plans. We want, we want to be part of, the, part of uh, economic strategies for local councils so that it blends in, so that people own it. One of the biggest problems, if you don't own the, own the waterways, it becomes stagnant. We have loads of antisocial behavior, and people have fears in their mind that if I go to the canal side, I'm going to be attacked or something will happen. In reality, none of those things happen. <coughs> so in terms of the problem for us, uh, in terms of the trust investing in cleaning some of the floating litters, mainly plastic, it costs millions of pounds. We have contractors. Apart from all the work that's freely done by the volunteers, we still have to pay people. We have on top of that, we pay we have a project around here with community payback, provision services. Uh, they also do a lot of cleaning. Even then, it's difficult to keep up. And what happens with this? The perception changes. Be when, when people see litter, you know, they think, oh my god, it's not a nice place. I shouldn't be here. Maybe it's, nobody cares about it. Nobody, no, nobody's done anything about it. So it's, it's the perception what plays into people's mind, and they gradually <coughs> depart. If you go to some of the affluent part, you always see things clean and tidy because the people get involved. They do things themselves and they don't wait for the authorities to come and get involved. And we also have loads of scientists working for us in our organization and they do a lot of tests and we know the ecology of the, there are loads of other things that we don't see in the canal, the geese, the dogs, the insects, the creatures, they have an immediate impact on the, on, on, on the environment. And, but we also want to look after this stuff that we don't see because that makes it nice. And so it's, it's really, like the doctor said, the microplastic is causing a lot of problem. And eventually the floating plastic will go into the bottom of the water. And we will have to dredge 
like John was explaining, and that costs a lot of mil millions of pounds. And one of the biggest problems in the Midlands in terms of dredging, a lot of contaminant from factories in the old days. So you cannot dredge the canal and take the soil, so you have to take it all the way to a place in Peterborough where they have to be cl cleansed and, or buried sometime for millions of pounds. That's an expensive process. So it's, it, it is a problem, and that's the photo that shows you one of the canals. That, and Walsall is a big example of this. Because we have surrounding area of us like Brown Hill, Rochelle, all these, these are all, all nicely looked after. If you come to the center of Warsaw, we have a problem because people throwing litter. And a lot of the boaters who, you know, they don't want to come here, they think we've got a problem in the center of Warsaw. And lot, we even had a complaint from the MP in Warsaw saying, how come I don't see any boats? narrow boats in Walsall, it's because of this issue, it's the perception. So hopefully with everybody being involved, we can make a difference. Next slide. But in terms of, in the last few years, we've done things in Walsall. If you were to get, if you were to get involved, that we had faith groups, community group, come to, look, what can I do? How can I get started? So we have something called the Torvas <coughs> Task Force. People come with us for three hours. We provide all the logistics, we provide all the equipment, we provide all the health and safety issues, and we, don't, we give them a hand in terms of, so we had, for example, uh, last year we worked with the school in Brown Hill and they, skilled, they wanted to fish trolleys out of the canal. And I, even after three years, the ki three hours, sorry, uh, children didn't want to leave the, leave the canal. They said, we really enjoy getting the, uh, the trolleys out and the plastic, <laughs> plastic cones out. It, they, they felt they achieved something, you know? Something was interesting, and it's really interesting. And we've also done cleanup with Hindu temple, with the Seva, Seva they have a national day. Uh, what's called Seva in Indian language is caring, isn't it? Service. So, service. Sorry? Service. Yeah, that's it. So they did, we, we did some work with them last year. We worked with the mosques. We've worked with some of the school. One of them mentioned in Millfield. We're gonna look, and they are one of those schools that are really advanced in their thinking, in their approach. So we're going to be working with them on something called the adoption scheme. That means they have a, a mile of the canal which they will take on an annual basis and they'll look after it. They have a plan in terms of what they want to do with the area and we'll help them, we'll support them. Uh, the doctor went to a young people clean up with the barbecue event organized by the council and the Afghan society. And that's where he found out about Canal River Trust and that's how I got involved into this one. I thought it was a very, very, very good beginning, I think. <coughs> in terms of uh, last year, we did something called Plastic Patrol. I'll explain in the next slide. I've done, I was told a few years ago in Walsall that Barchol is a no-go area. You don't go there, nobody gets, people get attacked and all kinds of stuff. But in, in fact, I went to Barchol and the community came out in droves <coughs> to do some activities, do some canoeing, kayaking, and they even helped me do some cleaning and so on. Uh, so it, it, it's sometimes, it's, like I said before, it's the perception issue is a big problem, how we tackle that. <coughs> We've already done an Eid festival in Walsall, which 400 people turned up. And again, it, we, we, I did some free boating trip for them. And then last year, in one of the schools in Barchol, I approached them in terms of to engage with the little children, what can we do? And they said we could do a, a poem competition. A nine-year-old wrote a poem that was published about the canal. So it was, it was really, really, so it was all changing. So in terms of plastic and stuff, next slide. This is a lady that, she's got a national project called Plastic Patrol. She came here last two years with us. We, we collected 40 bags of plastic from the basin, from the, from the Wassel, Wassel Museum next to Tours Plaque. 40 bags of plastic, that's a lot of plastic. And you know, this is on, on the left-hand side, BBC Midland today, sorry, one of the country files came to film some of the activities we did. And on the pic other picture you may not see properly, there's another guy who uses a water bike to collect plastic. He's based in London. He comes, comes and does free cleaning with us in terms of promoting and, and raising awareness of the plastic problem. If you go to the next slide, again, like I said, look at the, when we drain the canals to clean up, these, these are, look at the plastic. That's, that's on the bottom, and this is a costly business. If we can avoid them going into the first place, we could save millions of pounds that we don't have. And that could be invested in something really positive, engaging work with the community, uh, health and well-being and mental health, social aspects. Next one, please. This is again, she's working with the local community. And one thing with the, 
working with National Project, they have loads of following on the social media. So when, he, when she comes to Walsall, she's the 40, 50 people turn up, and she does it something, she does it on a paddle board. So she stands on a paddle board and collects all the litter. So it, and some of the people are really expert in paddle boarding, so they come, they think it's a sporting event. So we've got to look at, look at things in different ways. How can we, again, the working with the schools, we, what kind of inducement can we give them that will in, introduce young people into our waterways? We can't just expect them to work all the time and not give them something free. We work with some of the schools. They don't have to come to the canal. They can work from classroom in term, as, as a history project, as an environmental project, so that in a longer term, they will be aware of what the, what, the, what the history is, because the history of this kind of organization is so huge. They can study years and years, and they will still <coughs> won't be able to finish next one, please. And again, school kids, all the projects that I've done with the school, whenever the school kids come up outside, they really enjoyed every, every bit of the projects. They, they, there are also <coughs> a project going on in, in Birmingham, this one, Greening, greening, green Birmingham, where they're planting fruit trees, vegetation for people to have free when they grow. So it's, it's like in the old days, you used to have those kind of stuff where people collected all the freebies and nobody would say anything to you. So we are trying to recreate this in, in, in Birmingham, but there's no that we could bring it to also if needed that's as, as, a, as a change. Next one. And again, this, this is the one I told you about. We did, we did a plastic patrol that was last year. The year before, there was one last year. <coughs> and again, we could recreate all of those stuff. So in a nutshell, in terms of the activities in Warsaw, there's so much that we can do in terms of on ecology, on environment, on water, si water science, hydrology. The, as an industry, we are involved in so many different things. So in, for example, in two weeks' time, I'm, I'm involved in a uh, in a project in Aston University, we are inviting young people to go and have a look what kind of jobs we do in an organization like this. Because there are so many different jobs involved, even young people don't even know. There are so many engineering jobs that we do that people who don't even know. So if we can get them involved in all different directions, then they will be more enthusiastic to get involved. And I said to the doctor, if people, <coughs> there's an issue with what do you do with the plastic, and I've got some experience of developing social enterprises, if you will want to get some advice and support in terms of can they make some money out of setting up some social enterprise and take the plastic and turn them into something else, we, we might be able to help them in that as well. So just, uh, I haven't got more time, sorry, so I've taken more than enough. But if you do want to see us, one of my colleagues, Pete, will be outside in a stall. Our director, Adnan Saif, is also there if you want to have a chat. <coughs> please feel free. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time.